Welcome back to MVM. Today on the table, I have an upcoming prototype of a brand new game called Union Stockyards. This is a game about the meat processing industry in Chicago and is heavily rooted in historic fact filled with a lot of actual information about the Union Stockyards, which was the biggest meat processing plant in the entire world and was actually kind of a big deal in Chicago. Tourists would actually come all the way to Chicago just to see these plants. And the game represents that history through a worker placement game where you're playing as one of the popular meat packing companies of the time. Now this game can play up to five players with each player playing one of those actual companies. And like I said, it is a worker placement game. This is definitely more of a uh, heavy Euro. It's on that side. Although I wouldn't say that it is too complex. I think this is a great game for people that like those like mid to heavyweight Euro games. So let's talk about the components, the board, and how this game is played. Now you'll see the board here set up in front of me already. And this is set up for a four player game. And you'll notice that because we each have our meat processing plant here in Packingtown which is this one side of the board where we're actually going to be able to expand with more buildings. And you'll see those buildings off to the side over here. On the right side, you're going to have the stockyards. This is where you're actually going to be able to slaughter the animals and gain cash based on how valuable your meat products are. On the right side, you're going to have the district houses. You're going to have some brand reputation. And then over here, you're going to have the union tracker. Now, the game does make it easy to kind of know what you're supposed to do next. Your player aid tells you how to go through each one of the three phases, and they're actually lettered A through E. And you're going to see those letters printed on the board as well. So every time you get to a letter, you can see exactly which part of the board that's going to affect. And like I said, three phases. Your first phase is kind of a refresh. You're going to bring more livestock to the market based on the current market value. So you're gonna be adding these up here to the market spaces. As meat becomes very valuable, farmers are gonna bring that type of meat to the market more because it's valuable, they're hoping to make a sale. You have your cattle, you have your pigs, and you have your sheep which provide lamb. Now, the price of these is gonna start all the way down here at the bottom, but it can rise. And this is considered kind of the market value. And you'll notice if the market value gets higher, the farmers are going to bring more of that particular type to the market. This market shows what's available to be slaughtered, but the actual amount of money you're getting for slaughtering is based on your marker here, which again can go up and down. You're actually looking at the difference between how valuable your meat is versus the price you paid to get it. You're going to gain that amount of money in cash to make up that difference. That's kind of the core concept of making money in the game. You want to keep driving the price of your meat higher while potentially making the base price of meat where you don't really have value go up so other players can't really gain value from that. So there's a strategic market manipulation happening across this entire game. Then you're going to draw one of these year cards. Now year cards can do a variety of things. They're going to affect the game in one of two ways. First of all, they might give you an action space to take an extra additional action that year, or they're going to give you some kind of ability or some kind of effect that affects every player in the game. The year cards are also going to affect the union spirit. You had a lot of strikes happening, a lot of workers mobilizing into unions back then. If the union spirit gets too high, a strike can happen and everyone is going to lose somebody to the picket line. And you can kind of see on the front of one of the year cards how likely it is that a strike is going to happen. Year one can be anywhere from negative one to plus two on that union spirit track. Now, when you're building this year deck, you're going to draw six cards, one for each year. And you'll notice that they are numbered, so they get progressively different as you go through the deck. There are a wide variety of these year cards. I mean, there's, there's a huge deck that you can pull from. And each one of these cards is based on an actual historic event with some text and information, as well as the year that this is actually taking place. So once you build your deck, when you get to B, you'll see B is when you're going to flip one of those year cards and follow out its effects. So this card is actually going to lower the union spirit by one, and it's gonna give you a new action space to take here. 
If things had gone a little differently and this had climbed up to the strike level, then you'd actually, each player would lose one of their workers there to the picket line. But luckily that didn't happen in this situation. You'll see that C there. Then you're on to phase two, which is the worker placement and is the actual meat of the game. You're going to see a lot of these little ovals that have the dotted lines around them. Each one of these is a different worker placement space. So they're kind of spread out across the game board. Most of them, these small ones, can hold exactly one worker. However, some of the spaces, these two especially over here, can hold multiple workers, even multiple workers from the same player, and you could potentially have those worker placement spots on the card as well. Each player in turn order, starting with whoever has the first player token, is just going to place their worker and take one of those actions. I already kind of talked about the yards action, how to slaughter the meat, but you'll notice that there are only a certain number of animals out there for each of the types of livestock. Once you place your worker, and slaughter that type of animal, that one is gone. Now at the beginning of the game, there are four. Each player is allowed to slaughter once per year. So on the first round, everyone is gonna get the chance. But later, you might only replenish one or two of each one of these types of livestock, which means in future rounds, it's going to be more difficult. Not every player is going to get the chance to slaughter a particular type of animal. But again, timing matters. You wanna slaughter when your value is very high. The more profit you can get out of that, the better. Also, the more animals that are slaughtered from each one of the yards is going to affect, again, how the price changes. So again, by coming here and slaughtering an animal, you're actually adjusting the market price for other players. Now, it's possible if the value of a meat gets really high, you might actually lose money. The price you paid to buy the cow is actually more than what you're going to make. So you have to pay the difference, which is kind of crazy. Otherwise, you're just gaining the difference. You don't have to have, for example, the $17 to then get your 21. You just gain the difference, $4, and that's that. Now, right above the yards, you're going to have the campaign spaces. These are kind of the political spaces. You can either place a worker here to change the political party in charge. You can place a worker here to build a branch house in one of these distant city branches. Or you can place on whatever political party is available at the time. Right now it's the Republicans. You can pay $3 to place two branch houses. If somebody did come here to this campaign space, they would have the power to flip this to the other side and make it the Democrat space, which is an eight hour day. Now these actions are different and they're gonna change back and forth throughout the course of the game. The eight hour day is how you're going to lose your low morale tokens. You're gonna to gain these low morale tokens in a variety of ways throughout the game and you're gonna lose points at the end of the game based on how many you have. So having the eight hour day is a good way to get rid of them. It also lowers the union spirit. However, some players might not have any low morale tokens. They don't want you to get rid of yours and so they're gonna make sure it stays on the Republican side. When placing branch houses, you're going to have the option to place one of your buildings in any one of these available spaces and gain whatever benefit comes with that space. A lot of that is moving up meat value in a particular livestock, but you might also gain savings, which is this track around the outside of the board that kind of serves as victory points. It's considered savings. It's not liquid money that you can spend. However, it is going to score you points at the end of the game based on how far you are around that track. Think of it just like victory points. At the end of the game, you're actually gonna get points for your branch houses if people have built train connections. And you'll see there are spaces for train connections to be built out to these cities. This was also a big time of expansion for that train line. Above all that, the brand reputation track is going to increase the value of your brand. How well are you known? You can market to the nation, you can market to Chicago, and you can increase your brand. As you do, you might be increasing the value of your meat. So that's kind of everything that's on this side of the board. And over here, we have a kind of a different game going on simultaneously. And that is the building game in Packing Town. You're going to be able to buy land and then use that land to build buildings. So you'll see here the ability to buy land. It's going to let you take one of your land markers and just place it out somewhere on the board to show that you currently own that land and players can come out here and place these kind of anywhere they see fit. They don't have to follow any kind of pattern or anything. They can simply build or buy land anywhere. And these markers show that you're going to own these six spaces of Packing Town. This is important because eventually you're going to want to build. 
you're going to want to take that build action, which is going to let you build one of these cards. And again, all of these cards are actual buildings that were going to help with the processing and sale of meat. Whenever you build a building, you're going to have a cost and that cost is based on the size of the building you're building. For example, here we're doing a sausage kitchen, which is going to increase your value for pigs and give you some brand recognition. However, it's going to require you to place a four square building down. Now you can place this directly on a space that you already own, in which case you owe nothing, but you can place it on another player's land where you're going to have to place them a dollar for every space of theirs that you cover, or you could just place it out on government owned land and you have to pay the government all of that money. However, there is a caveat, whichever player is building a building, it has to connect back to their main slaughterhouse. Remember, you're carrying meat and moving things around between your warehouses, so they have to always be connected. So the red player could place that right there, the yellow player could place it right there, and so on, as long as it's touching your building. So it is kind of beneficial to buy land out from where you are, because you're wanting to eventually cover that space with buildings if possible. Now, not only are you going to get the effects of whatever is at the top of the card, you're also going to potentially get some in-game scoring points and you're going to get some points if you connect like buildings together. So the yellow player has this pork building here. If they came with another pork building and connected it like this, and you'll see we do have a connection back to their slaughterhouse here, they'd get some extra savings or extra victory points. And that's true for all of the different types of buildings. So as you're building them out, it's kind of, in your best interest to connect them in such a way that they match colors. You can also build these little viaducts that just serve as little connections, which could potentially then allow you to build other buildings and still have a connection back to your main packing house. Over here, you're gonna see those train markers I mentioned. If any player connects a building out to the point where it touches one or more of these markers, they're gonna place that marker over here in one of those branch areas. And you'll see that each one can hold its own token plus potentially a wild. And you're going to wanna to place these train markers where you have branch houses because it's going to increase their value at the end of the game. So now this branch house in the Bronx is worth two victory points at the end of the game. If someone were to build another train over to the Bronx, now this branch house is worth four points. And one player can have both branch houses or all the branch houses even in one space, in which case they're kind of making it their goal to get all the trains. And of course, you're making it your goal to kind of maybe block them out so it's difficult for them to get one of those trains set over there. And again, these buildings are not only give you points, they could give you some special abilities as well. You're going to slide all of them down and you're always going to have new buildings come out every time. And you'll see here, Again, all the different shapes of the different buildings that are required, and you'll see what's coming so you can kind of plan ahead. The last thing that you're gonna have on the card is a little symbol down at the bottom. This is gonna show your specialization. There are five specialization cards set out, and it's gonna show you what you need. So for example, fresh pork sausage requires two sausage buildings or pork buildings. If this had been my second pork building, I could immediately claim this specialization card and again, it's gonna give me some value, some points, and it's gonna set aside into my tableau. Then again, you're gonna have a few more spaces over here. You're gonna have the card space if possible. This is gonna give every other player a low morale token if you were to come and take that space. You have the option to do a wage increase, which is gonna also get rid of your low morale tokens. You can build those viaducts, those small buildings I talked about, and then you could come here for contract work. This is kind of a catch-all space. If you just really need money, you're short on money, you can come here and just gain a buck. That's really never a great option. You're probably going to want to slaughter an animal with that worker instead, because generally you're gonna gain more than a dollar. At the start of the game, you're gonna gain at least two. Now, each player is gonna go around the board taking three actions or less if you have people over here on the picket line, but you're gonna take all of your actions. And then you're going to move on to phase three, which is kind of the end of the year resolution. You're going to resolve the election if somebody had chosen the campaign spot, they're going to get to choose which side of that vote token they want to be face up. Then you're going to pull all of your workers back and then adjust the livestock prices. So you're going to see that livestock are going to change here. Whichever has the least is going to go up by three. So in this case, there's only two pigs. Pigs are going to actually go up in value by three. And now we've changed how many pigs are coming to the market on the next 
turn, it's more valuable because there's less of them. The most, we have the most sheep. We have four sheep left. So the sheep value is actually going to drop. Of course, it can't drop any lower, but if it was a little higher, it could drop down to a point where now it's changing how many are coming in the next round. And this is going to kind of ebb and flow as these prices change. You might end up with some situations where you have a lot of one type of animal and very few of another. So you'll be refreshing that again every single round. You'll be drawing a new year card, which could potentially give you some uh, you know, new union spirits, some new actions and things like that. And you're going to repeat this process over the course of six rounds. Now, by the end of the game, you've probably accrued quite a bit of savings just from building buildings and taking actions that are going to give you savings. And you're going to be adding to that in kind of a point salad fashion. You're going to add up all of the in-game points from all of your cards to potentially, again, increase the value of your uh, savings over here. You're going to add any cash on hand. Anything that you've accrued over the course of the game that you haven't spent is going to add to your value of victory points as well. Then you're going to look at all of the final scoring for the different animals. So even if you're not slaughtering on the last turn, you're still going to gain the value in each one of these categories or potentially lose points. If you haven't gotten your livestock value higher than what the actual value of the animal is, then you're going to potentially lose some points there as well. Generally, you're going to make points, but it can happen that you're going to lose them. Then, of course, you're going to look at the brand reputation track. Each of these spaces is not going to give you points on its own, but whoever has the highest brand reputation is going to get nine points at the end of the game. Then you're going to look over here at all your branch houses and you're going to see who has what points based on these train tokens. And then you're going to lose your points for your low morale. So there's a lot of things that factor into your final score. And there's a lot of ways that you can play this game to maximize your points. A lot of different strategies, a lot of different combinations of buildings that you kind of want to maybe focus on one type of livestock or kind of diversify into a bunch of different ones. You need to know right when to hit the market, when to get the most value for your meat, when to place a branch house to gain the bonus and also to gain the most points from these trains. So there's a lot of things. All of these mechanics kind of connect together in a really satisfying way to bring you to your final score. Whoever has the highest savings is considered king of the stockyards. You had the best brand. So that is Union Stockyards. You can take a look at their crowdfunding page to see what all the final components are going to look like. This is not final, although the board is gorgeous. The artwork here was done by Andrew Bosley, the name that people might recognize from games like Everdell. Fantastic artwork on everything. So even the production that I have here looks really good, but they did want me to denote that not everything is final. So the meeples don't look like they will. Some of the buildings don't look like they finally will. Some of the trackers and markers just look a little different. So you can see everything on their campaign page, what all the final miniatures and components are going to look like. But as always, if you have any questions, please ask them below, leave any comments. Let me know if you like mid to heavy Euro games. Let me know if this game looks appealing to you because it very much is appealing to me. So thank you so much for watching today. And as always, keep having fun at the table. Congratulations, you got to the end of one of our videos. Now, if you want more practice, just click on the video over here. It's another video. You might not have seen it yet, so click on it. If you don't want to do that, at least click on the subscription button below. That always helps us. And if you want notifications, please ring that bell.